but this morning I want to talk to you, and we have sort of talked about this topic a number of times in the past, but I'm not sure we've quite gotten a hold of it or it's quite gotten a hold of us 100% yet. And I want it to get a hold of us, and I want us to get a hold of it. And it's very simply tell this. Move past blessing to power. The power of God is the visible demonstration of His desire to reveal Himself to mankind. On Thursday nights a year or so ago, we talked about some theological issues, and one of them we talked about the Scriptures, and how the Scriptures are God's desire to reveal Himself, God's revelation to reveal Himself to mankind, to tell us what He is like and who He is like. And God's power is His visible demonstration. It is the demonstration of His desire to reveal Himself to you and to me and all who would have an ear to hear what He speaks and I to see what He does. I don't know about you, but I want to see the visible demonstration of God's power. Why? Because in this world, there are many circumstances that I come across that I need more power than my own power to meet. I need a revelation from God. I need the very revelation of God in the midst of the struggles and the turmoils, in the midst of the sickness, the hurt and the pain, that there is a power that comes from heaven that can save me and deliver me and heal me and carry me through. It is His spiritual power that makes His kingdom an action. It brings spiritual life. You see, many people experience religion. They have joined various faith journeys. Many churches talk about, get on the journey. They want you to go on a journey, a faith journey. They want you to just take little steps and walk. And somehow, all of a sudden, you just begin to know who God is. And I understand that sometimes we walk along the road of life, and there comes little bits and pieces that teach us who God is. But more often than not, if not always, there needs to be a point of time, whether we've been to one church service or a hundred thousand church services, where there becomes a revelation in our life, and we know that God is real, and that He has reached out to us. There needs to be a moment in our lives that we can pinpoint and say, this is when I met God. Not well, I've been going to church for a year and a half, and I think I'm committed to the organizational structure of that particular denomination. That's not at all what I'm talking about. That is the power of the manipulation of man. I am talking about the power of God that reveals the kingdom of God to the heart of man. And we know that God is real. And we commit ourselves to Him. Because the reality is so true and so stark that there is no other acceptable response for us. So this morning, while I recognize we're all journeying in life, I'm not just talking about a faith journey. I'm talking about an encounter with the Holy Spirit that radically transforms everything. That is the point of being born again. That is the point of the kingdom of God taking up residence in our life and shaping and redirecting who we are and where we are going in our life. It's what takes our priorities in our minds and what it is that we need to tally up so that we can make things work in life and begin to understand the priorities of God's kingdom and what makes things work, not just in the here and now, but in the here to come. And it begins to impassion our soul, so that there is nothing that God could ask of us that would be too great. Nothing too hard, too difficult, or too time-consuming, that when the Lord says, come, we have any response but to come and to follow Him. You see, people often get on these journeys, and they get involved with movements, or they get involved with denominations. And they get lulled into an unconcerned spiritual attitude. I go to church. I'm a decent person. I try my best. Those are all marks of religion versus an experience where you enter into a relationship with the living God. What's the problem? The problem is they have not experienced the power of the gospel that changes lives. You see, we can go to church for long periods of time. We can go to church all of our life. In fact, we could be, quote-unquote, born in church and die in church and never know who God is. Because I'm not talking about a journey with an organization. I'm talking about a life transformation where the power of God becomes reality and we step into a new existence and the old life passes away. 
even what we thought was our good religious aspects, they all pass away. And something new of the Spirit of God is built or, or drawn inside of us. See, people have not experienced the power of God to change their lives. Oftentimes, they're walking with religion. And even though they know all the right words to say, Hallelujah, glory to God, praise you, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm just saved by the blood of the Lamb and, Lamb and glad that I am, glory to God, hallelujah. They know all the jargon. They know how to dress for the particular congregation that they're going to. They know how to say, oh, yes, well, brother, I just love what the Lord is doing in my life. And meanwhile, they are empty and dead inside. They are defeated and they're discouraged. They're sick and they're wounded. And they recognize that their life is void of any spiritual power. They are spiritually dying and they know it. Or worse, they don't even begin to recognize it. Do you know what these kind of people need? The same thing that all of us need. They need to experience life after religion. When I speak of power or spiritual power, I am referring to spiritual might, ability, force, and strength, the power of God to work through an individual's life, to do the supernatural, to do what man cannot do in and of himself. It is a supernatural dominion which results in mighty works and mighty miracles taking place. The word authority is closely related to power. Authority refers to legal and rightful power to act on behalf of another. Taking authority is the action of demonstrating power. In the born-again believers, the case, the demonstrating the power of God, we should be men and women of action. We have been vested as disciples of Jesus Christ if we are born again and seeking His face with the very power of the kingdom of heaven to flow through our lives, to destroy the gates of hell. We ought not to be living under the circumstances. We ought to be rising above them in the power of God. We, not, might, we ought not to be living, uh, having this world lead us from one direction to the next, being tossed to and fro by every wind that comes our way. We ought to be walking in a straight and powerful line with the Spirit of God. Our lives submitted to Him, our hearts seeking Him, so that we recognize that in this life, while we might be weak in our own humanity, the strength of God is perfected in those times of weaknesses. Even when it looks like absolute failure, if we will submit ourselves to God, there is power for living. It's not the teachings of man. It is the very life of the living God. See, as Christians, born-again Christians, we have possession and we have right to exercise the power that God has delegated to us to further His kingdom. The early church was birthed in a demonstration of power at Pentecost and they continued beyond the day of Pentecost in that power as the church spread to Corinth, uh, Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17, it spread with authority and with power and many were turned to Christ. It was said of Jason and some of the other disciples that they, as they were dragged out of the house by the masses, that these men have turned the world upside down and they have come to our city to do the same thing. The early church affected entire cities and nations. They affected their known world with the power of God. And they did not do it by leading people on a journey. People listened to the message of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. And they responded to the power of God that was moving through the words that were spoken to them. And it changed their lives. And it changed everything about them. Why? Because they saw and they recognized the demonstration of the power of God. Acts chapter 8, if you would like to read along with me. Acts chapter 8, verses 6 through 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 6. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed. 
and many who were paralyzed and, and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. You know, very often today, we don't really believe that God is still able. Very often today, we know what to say, the right words to say in church, but religion is speaking through our lives. We see a miracle here and there. People run terrified. Oh, I think they might have a demon. Oh, I think the devil might be after me. Oh, the devil's trying to get on me. The devil is a defeated foe. He might have authority in someone's life that's given themselves over, but greater is he that is in you if you are born again than he that is in this world. Don't you dare cower from the devil when you are born again. Don't you dare say, well, I don't know what to do. I think they might have a demon. Say, in the name of Jesus. Make sure it's not the name of Jesus whom Paul speaks of. Because in the book of Acts, when they tried that, the demon said, Hey, we know Jesus, we know Paul, but you ain't nobody. You see, it can't be the Jesus that Paul knows. For me, it has to be the, the Jesus that Anthony knows. Not that Anthony's Jesus can be different than Paul's Jesus, but I can't depend upon Paul knowing Jesus. I must know Jesus for myself. You must know Jesus for yourself. If you're walking through life scared and afraid of everything... I want you to know something. Jesus has not given you that spirit, that attitude in your life. It's time to tear down that stronghold in your life because greater is the Spirit of God that is in you than he that is in this world. You look at all the cares of this life. You say, well, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to handle it. Get on your knees and fight like a man. Get on your knees, begin to pray and to see like a woman of God because God has called you to great things. He doesn't want you living under the gods of the enemy's power. He wants you living in the power of his spirit. Religion puts us under the weight of the enemy's lies and deception. Relationship with God rises up above it and causes us to walk in power and authority. Don't ever, if you consider yourself to be born again, you know your life has been changed by God. Don't ever let me hear you say, well, I don't know. I'm just scared the devil's after me. No. We shouldn't be running from the devil. Did you know God gave us spiritual armor and there ain't nothing to cover our backsides? So if you're running from the devil, you're going to get hit time and time again. We are told to hold the ground. Stand firm. Stand firm. Yes, it will be hard. Yes, it will be scary. It won't always go the way you think it ought to go. But stand where God has placed you. And when the pillar of the cloud moves, you move with that cloud. You move with the Spirit of God. When He says, break camp in advance, don't say, well, you know, I don't have time this week. How dare you? Your life is not your own. And neither is mine. We have been purchased at a price. The very lifeblood of Jesus. We don't get to say, well, I don't think I'm going to do that today. No. Jesus has called you. He has bid you come, get up and go. Don't stay. Don't make up an excuse. What the early church had was power and authority in the name of Jesus. They had no advertising budget to reach the city of Jerusalem. They had no Bible apps to give you a star because you read a chapter and a half today. I don't know, have you seen that? On some of these Bible apps, if you read your chapter a day for five days, it gives you a little star. <laughs> and this isn't for kids. This is for adults. If the only reason that you are reading the Bible is so you can get your little star at the end of the week like you were playing Candy Crush, you need to get saved. <laughs> we should be reading the Bible because it is the very Word of God. It is live. It is quick and active in us. And it separates bone and marrow. It does its work in our lives. We know God because of the revelation of God. And it transforms our lives and it renews our minds. And it builds a godly character in us. Amen. Not because you get a sticker at the end of the week. And you get five days. I thought there were seven days in a week. We don't get to take two days off. They had no Bible apps. They had no social media. They didn't have an internet campus. My goodness, how could a church not have an internet campus? But do you know what they did have? Jesus. 
They had power in Jesus. You know, if you have an internet campus, that's great as long as there is power flowing through that message. Often the church today has all these wonderful little toys, but no power. The early church had power. It doesn't mean that the church sent it and hasn't had power. It means we should have power. It was through the demonstration of God's power that entire cities were affected by the gospel message. I would surrender all and any financial benefit that we have. And I just mentioned a little while ago, our mortgage is paid off. There was time where we had no money in the bank. There was time when we had less than no money in the bank. We have got some money in the bank today. We may not be rich, but we are comfortable. And I would surrender all of that to know the power of God. You see, because you cannot buy a person's eternal soul. It's already been paid for by the blood of Jesus. It is the power of the gospel that saves, not the bank account. So often the church has been tuned in to the systems of this world that they have no idea that they're supposed to be a spiritual entity that is run on spiritual principles. God is our supplier, not the Federal Reserve. God is our supplier, not the Federal Reserve. The early church realized that the gospel of the kingdom was not only in word, but of power as well. As 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God is not in word alone, but in power. You know what too much of the church does? We talk too much. I know I do sometimes. Do you know what we need sometimes? We just need to shut up and let the power of God move. And we wonder, can it happen again? I want you to know this. It has never stopped happening. It may not happen for you or I or for some people that we're talking about this morning. But the power of God has not stopped moving. From the beginning of creation, when God said, let there be, His power went forth, and it has been going forth every moment of every day ever since, and it expands further and further and further throughout the universe. The power of God is on the move. So often we're stuck in a rut, we need to get out of the rut and get in the groove with the Holy Ghost. And we need to move with the power of God. Yes, it can happen, it is happening. What God has done before, He is doing now, and He will continue to do. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His purposes yesterday, His purposes today, are His purpose forever. That His glory should be spread throughout all the earth. <clears throat> if we are willing to move with Him, we can see great and mighty things that no eye has seen and no ear has heard of. No mind of man has ever conceived of. In early 1900s, William Seymour came on the scene and asked the question that is found in Acts chapter 19. Have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit since you believed? When the apostle, the apostle originally asked that question, the believers said that they didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. Paul explained the power of the Spirit to them. And power was manifest. 2,000 years later, that same power was manifest when Brother Seymour asked that question in the early 1900s. And do you want to know something? Wherever the heart of man is honestly seeking God, that same power is being manifest today. Wherever man's heart will honestly seek God tomorrow, the same power of God will be manifest. How mighty is that power? How encompassing is that power? It is the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. Spiritually dead people are brought to spiritual life. The broken are made whole. Those under the circumstances are lifted up above the circumstances. Those that are running around in fear and worry begin to gain confidence in the Holy Ghost and say, I'm not to be of a mind of fear anymore because I am a child of the living God. Many of us have received 
since we believed. So where is the power? I believe that one part of the answer is that we get caught again in the grips of dead religion. We get good at knowing how to do church and we do church rather than be the church. We grow stagnant in the place of blessing. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Lay your hands on the Rolls Royce and claim it in Jesus' name. Oh, go and grab a hold of that jet and say it's mine in Jesus' name. Did you ever notice only the guys at the top of the pile ever actually get the stuff? We get caught in the grips of dead religion. We stagnate in our own selfishness believing that God exists to be like a cosmic sugar daddy for us. Do you know what happens if you take a sponge and you dip it in a buck of water? It sucks up the water. And you can take out that sponge and you can wring it out and you can distribute fresh water to another location. You know what happens if you take that same sponge and you throw it in that same bucket of water and you leave it there for a month? It gets stagnant. It begins to grow stuff. It begins to get diseased. And all of a sudden it stinks. And you wouldn't want to take that sponge and squeeze it out any place. Because you would just be spraying the stagnation. You're beginning to spread the disease and the death. And too many Christians are like that sponge. They've been placed in a bucket of blessing. And all they care about is, Bless me, Lord! Bless me, Lord! And they begin to stagnate in it. They're so blessed that they lose sight of why God has called them. They get so blessed that they forget they're supposed to be on the move for the kingdom. They get so blessed that they forget that they were purchased with a price. They get so blessed that they don't think they have to do anything. And they stagnate and they die. I don't want to get stuck in the place of blessing without moving to the position of power. We need to move in power. Many believers do not experience spiritual power because they never get beyond the point of wanting spiritual blessing. They just want to sit in that bucket and soak it. The Holy Spirit begins to move upon them. They feel great joy. They express it in singing and shouting and dancing and crying. And those things are good and they are right responses. And there is nothing wrong with them. But we need to move beyond just the emotion of it. And we need to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. We need to yield the members of our body. We need to say no to the areas of our temptation and yes to the place of holiness. We need to stop compromising biblical standard. The Lord says that we are to come out from among them and be ye separate. Nobody wants to talk about the church being separate any longer. You know, if you do that, people just don't want to be part of what you're doing anymore. If they don't want to be part of the separate body of Christ, if they don't want to be separated from this culture, if they don't want to be separated from the immorality, if they don't want to be separated from the entertainment, if we don't want to be separated from those things, the truth of the matter is this. We're not the body of Christ. They're not the body of Christ. People always say, oh, you know, as long as they go to church, as long as they believe in Jesus, as long as this and that, as long as they do something, as long as they're sincere... No! There is one model for salvation. Come out from among them and be separate unto the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and the Lord says He will receive you. We try to make the gospel something different. And that's why we walk in religion so often. Because we don't have the life change. We don't have the place where we recognize I am a sinner. And something deep inside of us cries out, Oh God, have mercy on me. A sinner. Forgive me, God. Wash me. I accept the sacrifice of Jesus in my life. And I give myself to you. See, without that cry in the heart, you cannot be a member of the body of Christ. I cannot be a member of the body of Christ. I don't care what church I go to. I don't care how good the preacher is. I don't care what kind of good works they do. I don't care how long their history in the community is. Until the heart of man cries out, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He is not born again. Until there is a moment in time where we recognize that God is calling us and we yield to it, we are not born again. We have religion. 
Maybe we have an experience like that. As I said earlier, we get good at doing church stuff. And we forget that moment that we were so wretched and pitiful that we cried out to God. And we've sort of gone back on our commitment to the Lord. And we only want to do what fits into our day planner. You need to repent and say, God, I'm sorry I've walked away. I return to you. You need to go back to your first love and you need to do your first works over again. And you need to begin to get in the groove of the Holy Spirit and walk with Him. So often we say, as long as the mortgage is paid, as long as we have a decent car to drive and got some clothes and food, I'm blessed of God. See, it proves that I'm a Christian. It proves that God is with me. Let me tell you something. The devil will bless you straight to hell if that's what you're seeking after. There is a story in the Old Testament that I think illustrates this. It also illustrates the link between promise and the possessing of that promise. The nation of Israel traveled for many months from Egypt through the desert to the land that God had promised them. When they reached the edge of the promised land, Moses sent spies to check out the land. Ten of the twelve spies came back with negative reports. We can't do it. They're too big. We're like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Yeah, the land is beautiful, but we just could never do this. It's insurmountable. There were two spies that came back. Said, this is a fantastic land and God has given it to us. Let's go and possess the promise that God has made unto us. What happened to Israel chose to listen to the negative report. They were at the edge of the promised land. God's power was available to conquer their enemy, but Israel refused to move forward in God's power. There was nothing wrong with the promise. Some of us had promises that we believe are from God. We've seen them even in the pages of Scripture. And we've stood at the edge of the promise for days and weeks and months, maybe for decades in some cases. And we've looked out all over the land and said, man, that's good. But we've never moved to possess it. So, well, I don't know. You know, I know the Lord is good. And I don't care if I never see the promise of God beyond where I am right now. No, if God has given you that promise, He has made you that promise, there comes a point in time where you have to believe Him. And you have to believe that the Spirit of God is with you if you've been born again. And you have to move on that promise. And you have to conquer the giants that are in the land. There's going to be a Goliath or two that you're going to have to slay. There's going to be a walled city that you're going to have to shout at and see the walls come falling down. There's some practices of the culture you're going to have to do away with so you can walk in the culture of the kingdom and be uncontaminated. Israel chose to listen, listen to the negative report and they never entered into the land like they were supposed to. See, you must not stop when you get to the point of blessing in your life. Blessing is great, I can tell you. I honestly want to be blessed. I'm not saying that we shouldn't want to be blessed. <clears throat> but so often we get consumed with blessing that we never enter the powerful realm of the Spirit which makes those blessings a reality for our lives. You must break through into the spiritual realm of power. If you do not do so, you will continue to wander in the wilderness of dry, powerless experience and existence. If you are bored with church, I want you to know that it's not the music's fault or my fault. You're bored with God. If I am bored with coming here Sunday after Sunday, the problem isn't with you. It's a problem with my relationship with God. We don't like to say that. But whenever we are with the people of God, wherever that may be, if they are the people of God, if they've been born again by the Spirit of God, not they're religious, because that's what we're talking about, don't do it if they are born again by the Spirit of God, if they're not just some denominationally backed church, if they have been born again by the Spirit of God and they've separated themselves onto the Lord, there is fellowship with them for us. Because we are the body of Christ. See, we need to learn what the body of Christ is. We have accepted things into the body of Christ 
which are not the body of Christ. We've accepted things that are contrary to the scripture. Say, but they're good people, but they mean well. Oh, but you know, they've been around a long time. Oh, but look at the good things they've done. None of that saves. It is not by works that no man can boast. Salvation is the free gift of God. It is recognizing Jesus as Savior and Lord and yielding to it. No other formula works. Everything else is man's attempt to supply the power. And it always falls short. When we get bored with the genuine people of God, it means we're bored with our relationship with Jesus. It means we need to get on our face before God and cry out, Oh God, have mercy on me. God, reveal yourself unto me again. God, refresh me. We were singing this morning some songs that kept repeating, Send your power, send your spirit, send the refreshing Lord, more of you, more of you. Is it that God isn't enough? No, God is always more than enough. It's that we want in our lives to receive more and more and more of who He is. We want to have fellowship with Him on a more consistent and continual basis. You see, it's not that God as revealed isn't enough and we need to find out more. It's that we need to put aside the things of our own lives in this world so that we can see the revelation of who God is because it is more than enough. We cannot just stop at the point of blessing and say, Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Oh, Keith Green song used to say, That's all I ever hear. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Man, when's the last time that you just went to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Some people say, Don't say that. That makes men uncomfortable in church. By gosh, if you're not comfortable saying, I love you, then you don't know Jesus. And I would be amiss not to tell you men that you need to be able to say, Jesus, I love you. Father, I love you. Holy Spirit, I love you. I appreciate what you've done for me. What we have done is we've allowed psychology and we've allowed the philosophies of men to enter into the church so that we don't want to tell people that God is our Heavenly Father. Well, they'll be too uncomfortable with that. We don't want to tell people we need to love Jesus. Well, they're not going to be comfortable with that emotional display. I'm not saying we all need to break down, cry like little babies, but that can happen. I've seen some of the biggest, toughest men when they've realized who Jesus is begin to weep like little babies. Why? Because they saw themselves undone and they saw him in his holiness and recognized that though he had every right to destroy them, he chose to save them. If that doesn't bring a tear to your heart, if that doesn't bring emotion to your soul, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. You need a revelation of God. You must move beyond the point of blessing into the realm of power. You must become a demonstrator instead of a spectator. Did you know that church is not a spectator sport? We're not supposed to come here week after week and just sit. We're supposed to be living, active members of His body, demonstrating His power demonstrating his life. We are to be doers instead of only hearers. When you do, you will experience the true flow of God's power. You will experience an anointing. You will experience the presence of God within you, which you have never known before. You will experience life after religion and move past just saying, Lord, bless me, to say, Lord, empower me that I might work for your kingdom. When life falls apart, and from time to time, life will fall apart. Trust me, I know. You will fall apart too if you're only seeking blessings and promises. The person seeking these will say, I'm so tired, I'm so afraid, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm so wounded, I just can't fight any longer, I can't work any longer, I just need me time. Do you know what happens if you're a soldier in an army in the midst of a war and you just decide on the front lines that you just need some me time? Your me time will be dead time. <laughs> Religion has made so many promises that fall flat, that discouragement sets in. But the person vested in power says, in the day of darkness, when I have done all to stand, I will stand firm. I will not be moved. 
My heart is set and my face is fixed. And I am going on with Jesus. In that day, they will seek to impose the power of God's kingdom. And they will stand as overcomers in all things. You may think you can experience this power because you've never been to cemetery. I mean cemetery, seminary. You wonder why I say that when I say that cemetery instead of seminary. Because there are good men that have gone to many a cemetery, seminary and died there. They got bound up in their philosophical thoughts that they forgot who their Jesus was. Now, there are some very well-educated men, as the Apostle Paul was, that when they had a confrontation with the Spirit of God, all that knowledge was quickened and came alive. But so many times we get a degree or two. So, well, you know, I have a master's in divinity. I have a Ph.D. in ancient Semitic languages, and, you know, I am very well learned. I don't care Do you know Jesus. Smith Wigglesworth used to say, some people read the Bible in Hebrew. Some read it in Greek. I read it in the Holy Ghost. I don't care how many languages you speak as long as you know the language of the Spirit of God. Because that's where the power comes from. Because God can reveal the truth of His Word to us by His Spirit. So you might think, well, I've never been to seminary. You might think I don't have the right kind of education. You might say, well, if I've never had a denomination back me and credential me. You want to know something? I think you've got to step up on the rest of us then. You see, there were, so, there were the disciples of Jesus that were unschooled, uneducated, ordinary men. But what did the people that heard them speak say? They, hey, these guys have been with Jesus. You see, you don't need to be all the right schools and all the right institutions. What you and I need is to be with Jesus. That's where power comes into our life. That's where power begins to flow through our lives. That's where transformation can begin to take place through our ministry. But we must be with Jesus for this to work. The Word of God is filled with examples of ordinary men and women who were brought to the place of blessing and promise and then were willing to step in to the position of power. I believe on the Lord's scale, you and I are standing in the position of blessing. We're at that point. We need to decide if we're willing to step into the position of power. If we want to move forward and see people saved, delivered, and healed, we need not just to talk about the religion of promise. We need to show them the demonstration of power. And we cannot show anything that we do not have. We must have the power of God working in our lives because we have taken time to be with Jesus. I think of Abraham. He was nobody. And God called him. And just when you think he's getting on the right track of things, he lies about Sarah being his wife. Yet, that guy, God used to find and establish the nation of Israel. Moses, just a Hebrew kid that was supposed to be slaughtered. Stuck in a basket, sent down the river, found by Pharaoh's daughter. Became, to some degree, somebody in Pharaoh's courts. You know what God said? You're too much. Go on the backside of the desert, become nobody for 40 years. <laughs> now you're nobody. Now you can hear my voice and follow my direction. Peter, a big mouth fisherman, always said the wrong things at the wrong time. Hey, there's hope for some of us. <laughs> Coming down to the end of Jesus' time on earth, what does Peter do? He denies knowing Jesus. Certainly he's a failure, yet that ordinary failure kind of guy would stand up on the day of Pentecost because he received power. And he would give a message and 3,000 would be swept into the kingdom. Gideon. We find Gideon when we introduce to him. He's a young guy scared hiding behind the press trying to thresh some wheat so that the Philistines won't get it. And what does God say? Hey, mighty man of valor, get up. I'm hiding behind the press from my enemies. I just want to make some bread for the day. I don't know. I'm just looking to have a meal. You're a mighty man of valor. You're going to deliver my people. And by the way, you're going to have too many people in your army. So I'm going to pare that down. 
And he was raised up to destroy his enemies of his people. King David calls a young shepherd boy nobody. He grew up to commit adultery. And then he had the woman's husband put to death to kind of cover over what had happened. And yet, in God's economy, because he renewed his spirit, he was called the greatest king of Israel and a man after God's own heart. There's hope for some of us. We've blown it big. There's hope for us. Jacob came out of his mother's womb grasping at the heel of his older brother, always wanting something that didn't belong to him, always lying, cheating, and deceiving, manipulating things. And then he has an encounter with God, and he wrestles to the point of blessing, and the next morning he walks out in power. Peter and John, poor fishermen, had no money, had no education. But the healing power of God flowed through them to stir entire cities and the world throughout the ages down to you and me with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Rahab, a prostitute, faced with an opportunity, rose to the occasion and is listed in the genealogy of the Messiah. Esther, a young girl, nobody, an oppressed people, came to a royal position for the moment in history that she lived. And the people of Israel were delivered through her. Who knows but you and I have come to this point in time where we are for such a time as this. Will we answer the call and move beyond? Just bless me, Lord. And Lord, empower me for your kingdom's work. If men and women such as these were entrusted with the power of God, then so can we. So can you. Despite our human frailties, God calls ordinary men and women and makes them do extraordinary things. You might say that God calls the underdog to do the superdog's job. He doesn't see you as you see yourself. If you see yourself broken, weak, and defeated. He doesn't see you like the negative people around you say you are. He sees you as what you can be when you submit yourself to His life and His power. He sees you strong and bold and courageous, defeating the enemy and advancing His kingdom. God sees you as you can become when you're endued with spiritual power. God uses ordinary people, what the Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 calls earthen vessels, why? So that the excellency of the power that does the work is known to be of God and not of us. We struggle and we strive in our own ability to try and make the kingdom of God work. We can't do it. But the excellency of the power that does is of God. Let God's power work through your life. Church, I want you to understand something. God is not done with us yet. Some days it might seem like it. Some days it might feel like it. Some days the temple might look like it's in ruins. But I am telling you that the latter days are to be greater than the former days. It is time to press in to God. It is time to enter the secret place of the Most High. It is time to pray in the Spirit. And it is time to pray with the understanding. It is time to study His Word and show ourselves approved as workmen that do not need to be ashamed. It is time to put away childish things that keep us from going into maturity and the power of the Spirit. If your first thing anytime trouble comes up with someone rubs you the wrong way, say, oh, but you know, I just got to tell somebody. No! Stop that. It's nonsense. Grow up. Someone rubs you the wrong way. Someone's eye on their mind. Put your arm around and say, I love you with the love of Jesus. What you do unto the least of these, Jesus said that we do unto him. It's time to put away childish things and to grow up into maturity, into the power of the Spirit. It's time to understand that the culture of this world is not the culture of the kingdom of God. There is no fellowship between light and dark, between the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Oh, but we could just get a hold of the arts and we can, we can do what they do and be a bridge. No. 
We are not to imitate the culture of this world. If you look at the Jewish people, they were always separated out unto God. And as long as they kept their traditions and their values separated from the practices of the nations around them, their relationship with God flourished. As soon as they began to accept the traditions and the standards of the people of the world around them, they began to get defiled. And the pagan practices of their day became the pagan practices of their life. And they were defiled and they fell from grace with God. And God would often bring an enemy in to carry them off into a time of separ forced separation. A time of, 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 of being chastened. And in that chastening, they learned to return to the Lord and separate out the filth of the cultures around them. Sometimes we talk about the cultural traditions of the days that we live in. And people say, oh no, that's just ridiculous. You know, we just always have done that. Yes, you've always participated in the wrong things, but now you are a child of God and you are to come out from among them and be ye separate and, not, and touch not the unclean thing. There will be some challenges in the days ahead. Things that we've accepted as okay, that if we want to move in the power of God, we're going to have to break with. Why? Because it is the culture of this world. It is the culture of the pagan. And it has no place in the church of the living God. It has no place taking up a place in our hearts. Because the degree that we give it place in our hearts is the degree that it defiles us. And you know what? The defilement is always more than we think. You've heard the story about the brownie with just a little bit of poop in it. Well, it's just a little poop. It's okay. Go ahead, eat it. No! I don't even want the brownie if you didn't wash your hands after you used the bathroom. <laughs> Let alone you put a little piece of poop in it. No! Why? Because, you know, if you eat a brownie that someone didn't wash their hands after, it probably won't make you sick. If you eat a brownie that had a little bit of poop in it, it probably won't make you sick. But if you keep eating brownies that have poop in it, sooner or later that bacteria is going to build up and you're going to be sick. And sooner or later it's going to work its work and it's going to kill you. It's the same way in the spiritual realm. So put away those dirty brownies and eat good spiritual food. It's time to understand the culture of this world is not the culture of the kingdom of God. And that means that we will be marked as different and people will tell us we're overboard. People will tell us that's just not right. But who is our judge? We must not be lulled to sleep by man-made religion that tells us everything is okay. Well, you know, times have changed. The Bible is a good book and it has nice principles. But you have to understand that we live in a modern era. And people's understanding of sexuality, people's understanding of family, people's understanding of this, that, and the other thing, it's all changed and that's okay. No, it's not. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is immutable. He does not change. What He has decreed for man yesterday or eternity past is what is valid for today and for eternity to come. Amen. But you know, I just really like the way they dress it up. I really like the vestments of man's religion. It just it has so much meaning and value to me. Someone told me that one time after they left the church and went to a liturgical church. Oh, you know, I just like the, the traditions that they have. I just like the way that they have the same pattern to do things over and over again. No, you don't. You like escaping from the spirit of the living God that's challenging on the air of your heart. And you're going to die in your defilement unless you submit to the spirit of God. You don't have to come to church here, but go to a church where the people are worshiping God and looking to walk with him. Doesn't matter how finely you dress up, religion, investments, it will always kill. I am looking for a few people who want to work for the cause of Christ with me. If just a small group of us disciples would be willing to work with the Spirit of God, we could turn the world upside down with spiritual power. That's what the early disciples did. Imagine what could happen to Cairo if just a group of us began to work under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, under the power of the Holy Spirit. If we weren't just concerned with, bless me, Lord, but Lord, empower me to be a witness. What could happen? Men could get saved. Families could be put back together. Drug addiction could be broken. 
People that are lost and, and bound in sexual perversion can be set free. Those bound by all the power of the enemy can have those chains of darkness broken over their lives and they can know the true and the living God. I have to say this morning, I don't want to hear that it can't be done. I don't want to hear that there isn't enough here to make it happen. That you have too many other concerns in life. I don't want to hear that you just can't. Because to say that you can't means that you're saying that we can't, which means to say that God can't. But I am telling you today that God can, which means we can, which means you can. If we would just have the will to yield to the anointing of God. I hope that the voice of religion is to be silenced in our ears. The voice of religion will tell you, you don't have to do that. You don't have to be so concerned about talking to people about Jesus. You don't have to be concerned about the work of the church. If there's not enough people to get anything done, but you're not needed there. You've got your own business to take care of. Did you know that you are a slave of Jesus if you were born again? The scripture tells us that the servant is out in the field. And after a long day of working, he comes in and the master says, make my meal. The servant doesn't say, oh no, I don't have time for your meal. I've been working all day. I'm going to go grab an apple out of the fridge and then take a nap. Get your own dinner. No. The master says after all day before you take care of your needs, you meet my needs. You tend to my needs. You do my work. You know what that servant does? Tends to the needs of the master. And then if there's time left and strength left, he tends to his own needs. We have a good, good master. It's time we stop taking him for granted. It's time we stop saying, well, I don't really have to do anything. God knows my heart. Because you know what the problem is? He really does. And our hearts are wicked and deceitful above all else. I told somebody that the other day. I forget what we were talking about. I said, man, my heart really is wicked and deceitful above all else. And they laughed. But I was serious. It just so easy comes to us. We can fool ourselves. We can say we're doing this and that and that's a good thing. No. God has a calling for His body. God has a calling for this church. If you and I are members of this church, God has a calling for us to Cairo. I believe we will reach beyond Cairo, but we start here when we move out. It's not time to say, well, I'm too busy, I'm too tired, I do this, I do that. What are you so busy with? Put it aside. Let it fall by the wayside. And serve your God. Because you can with the enablement of the Holy Spirit. If you are walking in powerless religion today, I've got good news for you. There is life. There is powerful life after religion. You don't have to be stuck in its grips anymore. Throw off the bonds and seek your God. Psalm 63, verse 1 and 2. Let it become your mantra. Oh God! You are my God. Have you ever thought about that statement? Oh God, you are my God. Not you are my buddy, you are my friend. You are my subservient. God is like a pretty big title. That's like everything. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. If you are out there in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water, begin to look in the sanctuary of your God. Begin to look to see His power and His glory. And remember Jeremiah 29, 13 promises us that when we seek Him with all our hearts, we will find Him. And when we find Him, the promise becomes a reality and we can step beyond the bless me and into the use me. God wants to use you. He wants to use us. He has a work to be worked. I don't care what the last 30 years have or have not been. We can't do nothing about them, but we can decide what we will do with this moment and the next. I don't care what pressures from life or work or family are on you. Jesus has called you to meet the needs of the kingdom of God. Not of your own power, but in His power. See, He doesn't expect us to bring the power to heal, to save, or to deliver. He expects us to bring the availability. And then He endues us with power. It's not a journey. 
It's a life transformation. If you don't know that transformation in your life, you can know it today. You can say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me of my sin. Deliver me. And I will serve you with my life. And everything will begin to be transformed here and now. If you've prayed that prayer, but you've gotten so wrapped up in the cares of life that it's been choked out, you can say, Lord, have mercy on me. I return to my first love. And I want to do those first works over. Give me power. If you've been walking in the Spirit, and everybody always likes to say that they're walking in the Spirit, but to be honest with you, not every one of us can be because we just don't see enough. In fact, if just a few of us were walking a little bit more in the Spirit, we'd see a whole lot more. So very few of us will fall into this category that we all want to put ourselves there. If you've been walking in the power of the Spirit, continue to follow the direction of the Lord. But I think most of us fall into one of the first two categories. And it is time for us to move beyond just wanting to be blessed or just wanting to have religion just in case. And it's time to walk in the responsibility of relationship with God and fulfill the calling of God. No longer can we say, I just don't have the time. I just don't have enough time or power or strength. I just have too many responsibilities. I've got these other really neat things that I do. And that's how I serve God. No, if you're not serving the kingdom, I don't care how good the works are, you're wrong. Oh, well, I just like to participate in some things that the world has for me. No, you're wrong. There are festivals in the communities around us that are nothing but pagan ritual. And I see Christians saying, oh, tag me so I can go. It's time to be separate unto the Lord. Oh, you're overboard. No, I want to be endued with power. I want to be a believer in Jesus. I want to walk with people that believe in Jesus. I want to be a part of a people that have something more then pagan ritual rehashed as Christianity to offer the masses because it will damn them as well as myself. I want to know the power of God that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. I want to know the power of God that makes me more concerned about the need of lost humanity than whether or not my 401k is growing. I want to be consumed. I want you to be consumed with the kingdom of God. But the things of this world need to fade. We used to write songs like that. That this world will grow strangely dim in light of Jesus' face. It sings so well, but we don't live it on the by and large. But God is calling us. He's calling us to come up higher. He's calling us to walk deeper into the rivers of life. He's calling. Will we have an ear to hear? Will we have an eye to see? Will we have a desire to move past, bless me, Lord, to move past religion and say, Lord, empower me? Father, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts and our minds in this very moment of time. Lord, I pray that you would convict the hearts of men and women for righteousness. I pray, God, that you would convict the hearts of men for salvation. That you would convict the hearts of men to leave the cares of this world in the past and be consumed with the principles of your kingdom and the priorities of your kingdom. And Father, I ask that as hearts begin to move towards you this morning, that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would breathe afresh and anew upon us. That power, your power, would be made a reality in our lives. That we would not walk by the strength of religion. That we would not walk by our own strength. That we would not just walk to be blessed and stagnant. But we would walk to display the righteousness of God, which is given to us in Christ Jesus. That we would walk to be demonstrators of the power of the gospel, calling men out of sin, calling men out of the cultures of this life into your kingdom and its culture. Lord, may your Holy Spirit now purify our hearts and our minds as we read your word today and tomorrow and throughout this week and the rest of our lives. May you give us supernatural revelation 
into the Scriptures, that we might see Jesus in all of His glory, and we might serve Him in power and in might. Lord, we ask You these things in the name of Jesus, that You might build Your church, living stone upon living stone, and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Amen. 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 God bless you.